circumstance isn't really, you know, your circumstance isn't, like, there's no bad circumstances that are happening, but there's just something happening and that is bad and you can't explain it. And you, don't, you can't put your finger on it, but you know that there's something dark around you or something dark around something, around you in some way. And I want to share with you an experience I had when I was working in my past job at DuPont. Um, I was um, promoted in my job and I moved out to uh, a, a, a plant. We, we manufactured paint and I was a, rep, a tech rep that manufactured, that serviced the paint in various um, clients that we had or customers that we had. And, um, you know, going out to this particular client, we were there, I was there for a number of years just servicing the paint there. And it, came, it got to a point with, where with me, there was a darkness that just kind of enveloped me. And I felt like thoughts were coming in my head. At the time, I didn't know it. It was just, I thought it was my own thoughts. And, but I was just like, I would walk the street, I'd walk across the street and I'd feel like a car would come and hit me. And I was afraid that a car was gonna come and hit me and just knock me right off the ground. Or I would be walking through the plant and it would feel like something will stick out and spierce me in the head. I would, um, you know, sit, sit, in, sit around and just feel defeated, feel hopeless, feel like, you know, um, my life is wasted. And I, I had no reason to think that, but I was just feeling those kind of, those negative emotions that were coming over me. And, and um, I had to talk to the Lord about it, just, you know, because I, I was telling him what's going on. I felt one of my greatest fears is to waste my life that I would be working so hard and nothing, it amounts to nothing. I hate to be unproductive. That's one of my, my worst fears. And I was feeling that overwhelmingly. Here I am, you know, just got married, I'm working, I got promoted, um, but I felt my faith, was, my, my walk with God wasn't really happening the way I wanted it to, and I'm in a job that I may not really like, and, and it was just coming down on me, and it was just negative. If, if I wasn't careful, I wouldn't want to go to church. I wouldn't want to do anything. I just wanted to collapse into my cocoon. I had negative thoughts. I had negative emotions. I had an overwhelming sadness. I had an overwhelming hopelessness. I could feel darkness around me, and I feel that I was wasting my efforts. I don't know if this has ever happened to you, but it was definitely a learning experience for me to understand that sometimes negative dark forces will try to hold you up in life. And it's not because of per circumstances or people, but there's some, another force that is working against you. What do you do when you're living the life, living your life the best way you can, but you can feel hindered by an unexplained dark darkness that's around you? If you've ever encountered these dark forces, or if you can identify what I'm saying here this morning, then you have probably entered in what I call the cross valley, and we'll get into it in the sermon. This is the third valley that Jesus experienced in his ministry on earth. Unlike the heart valley that was initiated by God and the people valley that is initiated by people around you, this, this cross valley is initiated by the de demonic. By the demonic. And yes, there are demonic forces in our world. Th that demons are very real. The darkness is very real. It's not something we talk about a lot because in our world today with science being at the forefront of, of truth, um, we minimize these kind of discussions as myth and folklore. Uh, but in our Western culture, um, you know, we, we look at this as myth mythology, but in other parts of the world, this is a very serious topic that is being recognized in the public sector that there are demons out there that will cause heartache and pain in our lives. And it's nobody's fault but the demons. The Bible says that we have an adversary who prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to have devoured. It says that in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. And this enemy, the chief enemy of our soul, the Bible describes as the devil. Jesus said his number one goal is to kill, steal, and destroy. His number one goal is to destroy God's creation. And this is what he tried to do to Jesus in putting him on the cross. 
And so we're going to get into this a bit in terms of, you know, what do we do if you've, if you've encountered this? Sometimes we encounter this and it's not our fault why we encounter this. Sometimes children encounter this and it's not their fault. Sometimes the devil does not care who he goes after. He doesn't play fair. He cheats and he will scrumble at anybody and anything to destroy God's creation. He doesn't care if you're Muslim. He doesn't care if you're Catholic. He doesn't care if you're Protestant. He doesn't care if you're Pro Pentecostal. If he can get you, he will get you. He's no respecter of persons and he respects no one, not even God himself. Can you imagine he comes to Jesus to try to throw him off his game? Jesus is not shy on the subject when it comes to the demonic. It was actually because of Jesus' ministry why we understand the demonic very more easily. In the Old Testament, they never really talked about the demonic as much. It was more written in the mythology of the scripture. But when Jesus came on board, he started to open up the subject. He started to talk about it. He started to demonstrate certain kind of authority and power that people who were bound with the demonic, he would just go there and, and re heal them and deliver them. And people were instantly healed and delivered. People were in awe about Jesus when he was doing his ministry. And it was something amazing to see. But the devil, when Jesus started his ministry, we talked about this in our first sermon, the devil came to Jesus when he was in a weak place in, in, the, in the desert and tempted him for 40 days. It's interesting, Jesus starting his ministry, just starting off, and, and you know when you just start something, you're, you're most vulnerable, right? You don't know much. You're just trying to figure things out. But he comes and tr he figures that would be a good time to get Jesus because he doesn't know much. Let me try to step on him right now. And he came and he tried, but he failed. Remember, anything you start new, anything in your life that is new, anything that you take a first step, you don't be surprised that there's some, un there's some weird forces that are working against you because the devil wants to step on the new and abort it before it's time. Yes. Hello, somebody. He hovers around things that are new because he doesn't want God to get the glory in your life. He doesn't want God to be glorified. And so he, anything that is threatening him, anything that is taking on uh, a new territory, he will hover around and try to destroy it. And this is what the devil did with Jesus. He went, when Jesus was just beginning his ministry and tried to tempt him, discourage him, harass him. But thank be the Lord that he, Jesus, prevailed. Amen. He was able to overcome. And the scripture says that the devil went away for a season. For a season, meaning for a time. He's coming back. Hello, somebody. You may have got rid of him last week, but he's still coming back. You know, I used to think, you know, as soon as I get rid of the devil, he's done. He's gone. But no, he comes back. And he came back again. He came back again to torment Jesus. And here is near the ending of Jesus' ministry. So there's another lesson. Anything that you're finishing off. And you're almost at the finish line. The enemy may come to try to stop your finishing line ability. Amen. He's going to try to get you to quit. You're almost there. What does it says? Weeping endures for the night, but joy is coming in the morning. Just when your dawn is about to break, just when something is around the corner about to bless you, that's when you want to quit. That's when you said, I'm throwing in the towel. That's when it says enough is enough. I've been doing this too long. That's the devil's voice telling you, you need to quit before you start, before you finish. And you just need to keep going on because there's, there's joy coming. There's a, there's, a, there's a dawn coming at the darkest part of the night. And here is Jesus just about finishing his ministry. And he's having a wonderful meal with his, with his disciples. It's called the Lord's Supper. And we're going to do this at the end of the service. <laughs> and he's talking with them and, and, and encouraging them. He washed their feet, you know, their smelly, stinky feet. He washed them to show how much he loved them. And he said that you must do this with one another. And then he gets them to set the table. And the 12 of them, the 12 that started off with him, are the 12 that are still there. And they're all having a holy meal. They're all worshiping before God. They're all listening to Jesus' teachings. And do you know what happens? The devil shows up right in the midst of that worship. The audacity of the devil to come right in there and show up right in front of those disciples and in front of Jesus. It says here in John 13, verses 27, as we read already, as soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered into him. So Jesus told him, what, you, what you're about to do, do it quickly. Yeah. Now this, this verse really wowed me. As I was preparing for this sermon, it just took me back. If I saw the devil show up in church, 
In our, in, in our Pentecostal tradition, we are going to say, you get out of here right now in the name of Jesus. We're going to yell and shout and, you know, you don't belong in here. But here, here the devil shows up. Jesus sees the devil show up and Jesus is just chilling. You know, he's not even freaked out. You know, some of those horror movies, you see the monster and you're jumping because you, you see the monster. Jesus is just chilling. A monster just entered the room and Jesus is just chilling. Isn't that, isn't that crazy? Come on now, somebody. That, that just got to puzzle you for a little bit. Jesus is just chilling and saying, okay, you're here. Kind of reminds me in the book of Job when Job was worshiping God. And the angels of the Lord were all around Job. And God was in the, in, in the presence of Job. And then the devil just starts walking up and saying, hey, what's going on here? And God is having a conversation with the devil. There's definitely a mystery between God and the devil in how they connect and interact with each other. The devil is not the equal opposite to God. The devil is an enemy of God, but it's not the equal opposite. It's not the yin and yang. There's no equal good and equal bad. The devil is a created being. And he decided to go against the ways of the creator who is God. And God is allowing the devil to have his chance because God is a just God and he will not manipulate, not even the devil, will not manipulate his power over any created being. And so to show God's justice, he's allowing the devil to have his play. But in the end of time, when Jesus comes back, the devil will be defeated. Amen? Amen. Amen. The scripture says that he will be put into the pit of fire with all his minions. And so here Jesus is just chilling and he's talking, having a calm demeanor with the enemy. What is even more interesting is that he's unfazed about the devil's presence and is unconcerned if the devil has any ability to trouble Jesus and what he's doing with his disciples. We don't need to be afraid when we discern darkness around us. We don't need to be freaked out when we know that the devil is right sitting beside us because we have a God that is in us. It says, greater is he that is in us, who is Jesus, than he, the devil, that is in the world. They call the devil the prince of the air. But we serve Jesus, who is, a, who is the creator of the world. Jesus was not intimidated by the devil, even though the devil has a roar. You know, like a lion, a lion, sorry. A lion roars loud. And his roar brings fear to the creatures in the jungle. The devil has a roar that will try to intimidate us and to make us have fear. But Jesus did not give in to the devil's tricks and he was not afraid of the devil. But you know the the thing that really took me back with, with Jesus was his response to the devil. The scripture says, soon as the, uh, Judas, the, um, Judas dipped, his, um, dipped his bread in, the devil entered him. And then Jesus' response was, so Jesus told him, what you are about to do, do it quickly. What is that? It's one thing to know the devil's there, but then to tell the devil, go ahead and do what you're doing? Now, what is Jesus talking about? You know the devil came to kill, steal, and destroy. How can you tell the devil, go ahead and do what you're doing? I'm not giving the devil permission to do what he's, he's going to kill me. Is anybody reading the text like me? Do you see what I'm talking about? He looks at the devil, he looks at Judas, and he says, do what you're doing quickly. Now, I'm going to say in the name of Jesus, I'm every work that you do, I'm, I'm, a, I'm binding it up, I'm, I'm tying it up, I'm loosing it up, I'm getting it out of my family, out of my church, out of my job, out of my, you are out of here and don't even try anything. Hello, somebody. But Jesus is chilling, and he says, I give you the permission to give me your best shot. I give you the permission to go and do what you're going to do. You know why Jesus is doing all this? Because he's giving him the permission to take him, giving the devil permission to take him to the cross. To take him to the cross. There's some things that God will give permission to the devil to do to you. Hello, somebody. There's something God will say, okay, devil, I will allow you to do this much to my child. We see this in the book of Job when the devil says, you know what, I, I, you've been putting a hedge around Job. I think if you allow me to get at him, he will curse you. 
And God says, you consider my servant Job, the one who is faithful? And God says, okay, I'll let you do it, but don't touch this. We see this with, with um, Apostle Paul, who prayed three times for this demonic thorn, mysterious thorn in his flesh to be removed. And every time God said, no, I'm allowing it to be there, for my grace is perfect in your weakness. My strength is sufficient for you. It's amazing how Jesus thinks and how God thinks and why he does what he does in our lives. But what we understand here is that why Jesus could do this is because he knew he was on a winning team. You know, I play basketball, you know, and we play against an opponent team, right? And when we play against the opponent team, we come with our game plan to, de to defeat the opponent. And they got to give their best game, offense and defense, and I got to give my best game. <coughs> and hopefully, if we play well enough, we'll win. But there's no guarantee. But think about Jesus. He's got a game plan. The devil's got a game plan. The only difference here is that Jesus knows he already wins. He already knows that when this game is going on between him and the devil, he's already going to win this. He already knows this in advance. Did you hear what I said? The scripture says when he goes in this cross valley, he's about to be glorified. It says it here in, in John 13, verses 31. And Jesus not said, now the son of man, right after the devil went to do what he's doing, he said, Jesus said, now the son of man is glorified and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will glorify the son in himself and will glorify him at once. And this glorification is speaking about the cross that Jesus is about to bear. Jesus knew the devil was going to take him to the cross, but he knew that the cross was a means for which God, Jesus would be glorified. Well, what does this glorified mean? This glorification means to have splendor, to have greatness, to be clothed with greatness and splendor. Jesus knew that, that the devil had a plan, but he also knew that God had a better plan. Hello, somebody. Amen. Come on, you need to tell somebody that, that even though the devil has a plan for my life, God has a better plan for my life. Jesus said the devil came to kill and to steal and destroy your life, but Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. God has a better plan than the devil's plan for your life. Oh, hallelujah. In other words, the devil meant for evil, God is going to turn it around for good. Oh, come on now, somebody. What if the devil meant for evil? God is going to turn it around for your good. Jesus knows that in the cross valley, he will not be destroyed by the devil. His life will not be destroyed. Rather, his life will be promoted and it will be glorified for the glory of God. He will be clothed with the greatness of God all over his life. He will be clothed with the favor of God and the greatness of God all over his life. In other words, what Jesus did in the cross valley, God is going to undo in his glory. Oh, hello, somebody. What, Jesus, what, what the Satan did in the cross valley, yeah. G, um, God is going to undo in God's glory. Yeah. What Satan did was kill Jesus on the cross. But when it was all said and done in the grave, Jesus, God raised up Jesus from the grave. Yeah. Hello, somebody. Hello, somebody. You can't keep a good man down. You can't keep a good woman down when they are filled up with God, when they are walking with God. You can't even kill that man because there's going to be a resurrection one day. Oh, hallelujah. That not even death will hold us captive because in the grave, Jesus is Lord. Amen. The devil gave, him, gave Jesus his best, his best game plan and that was to kill him because that was the greatest fear of all the humanity is to die. That was a secret weapon. But Jesus took that, took that strategy and he ripped it up to shreds. Amen. And when he came out of that grave, he said, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. He came up and he became the, the king of kings and the lords of lords. All creation is now under his feet. Hello, somebody. Read it there in Colossians chapter 1. Read it there in Ephesians chapter chapter three, and you'll see that God, Jesus takes all dominion and power. After the devil does the best in your life, God is going to get the last word in your life. Hello, somebody. Amen. God is going to get the last word in your life. When you go through your cross valley, you will experience the resurrection power of God's glory. 
So what does this mean to us today? I mean, that's good for Jesus, and he seems to be a pe peculiar person for which this works for. If I die, I'm not going to be resurrected until the last day. <coughs> and you're probably right about that. Again, there's some stories about people being resurrected. But the key thing that we must take from this is that when we, we must go through our cross valley. Whatever that cross valley is in your life, we must go through it. Whatever that thing is, that dark force that God allows to be around us, we must go through it. We must not run from it. We must not quit. We must not sink and hide. We must go through it. We must face our greatest demons. We must face our greatest fears because if we don't, we will allow fear to cripple us. And God said he did not give us a spirit of fear, but he gave us a spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. If you don't go through this, you're going to be held down. Your life is going to be held down down, you're going to be not be the person come to the potential that God wants, to, to, wants you to become. You better look at yourself in the mirror and say, God loves me and God made me on purpose. And there's no devil in hell that's going to stop the goodness that God has in my life. Hello, somebody. Oh, glory to God. My greatest fear was my job, losing my job. Because I remember I told, I told Marsha, I want to make lots of money. I even told my mom, I want to be a dentist because that makes lots of money and I don't have to get my hands messy like a doctor. And then I learned about, you do get your hands messy, but that's another story. But I wanted to make money. I, I wanted to have money. I wanted to have a job that got me money because I didn't have to want to worry about, you know, anything. I just wanted to have stuff. And here I'm in a job that, you know, was on the, on the workings to get that money. But as I was in that job, God starts to deal with me. He starts to tell me, you know what, money ain't all that. <laughs> and as he starts to deal with me, he starts to, um, you know, things start to happen in my life where I'm starting to lose my job. I was like, what's going on here? He starts to change my heart to want to do something else. But then in the, as he started to change my heart to go into ministry, there's rumblings in our job at DuPont because of the auto crisis that happened in 2008 that we could potentially lose our job. So now I'm dealing with the whole um, issue of where am I going to get money from if I lose my job? Where is going to be my next paycheck? Now it's not about just making lots of money, just make sure I have some money. <laughs> Lord, don't let me go high and dry. And so I, I got into a period that the Lord was dealing with me and my vulnerability was to have money and the devil knew that vulnerability and he was playing on that, that, uh, that fear to say, you're about to lose your job. And do you know what happened? And most of you know this already, but in the same day I picked up that pink slip from my job that I resigned from DuPont, that same day, as I was at 9 o'clock, I pick up my, my pink slip. That same day, I had a meeting with the bishop of our church. And the first question he asked me, what do you think about full-time ministry? And I told him, man, if you'd have only known the day that I had right now. <laughs> he had no clue that I lost my job, but I said, this couldn't come at a better time. That happened in March in 2009. By August in 2009 of that year, I was installed as a lead pastor of this church. Now, come on, somebody. Does God not know how to make what the devil did in one end turn it around for God's good? I lost my job. The auto industry crisis, the crash or whatever, the greed or whatever, the things that happened in, in the economic market, pun punneled and lost it. It died. It died. Did you hear what I just said? My job died, but God raised it back up again. My job was gone. Oh, come on, somebody. I had no money. There was a period of time, I mean, there was a period of time when I lost my job to when I was, um, when I was coming into the ministry. I didn't know when I was going to be in the ministry. I didn't know if it was that soon. And I was there just headache in front of the computer, trying to get resumes done, trying to, you know, as much as, as, much as I like to pray, you got to be realistic, right? You got to pray, watch and pray, the scripture says, right? Watch and pray. So I'm praying and typing. 
Lord, let this resume come through. I'm applying for this job. I'm applying for that job. And I, everything is closing. Sorry, not, 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 not taking you. Sorry, we're not hiring. Sorry. To the point that my specialty in, the, in my work field was shut down. The, the developmental technologist was hired nowhere. I had to go to the, probably to the States to get something. And there was nowhere around. And I was just beside myself. I was just going through craziness. And I didn't know what was going on, but then God knows how to bring people in your life to encourage you when you're losing it, when you know that nothing you can do is working. And so a brother calls me out of the blue and he just says, Kevin, part-time ministry is part-time reward. Full-time ministry is full-time reward. Hang up. And I go, what was that? Where did he come from? He's like from Toronto. He doesn't even know my situation. But the Lord was doing something in my life, and he was bringing th people in my life to let them know, you're going to be okay. God is killing something so he can raise something better up. God was killing my career so he can give me what I, I love. He's killing my dream so he can give me his dream. And you want to know, when I got his dream, it was an amazing dream. I felt I was in the honeymoon. I started my job all over, and it was the best job that I could have. You ever been in a job and you're, you have to pinch yourself that I'm actually getting paid for this? Come on now, somebody. They're actually paying me for this that I love to do? God knows how to turn your life around and to get you exactly what you're made for. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, and that valley has monsters in it that want to tear you up, Jesus says, fear no evil. Because he said, I am with you. Amen. Oh, do you know what God is saying in your life? Nothing can destroy you when God is for you. Nothing can, dis can disintegrate your life to the point that it means nothing when God is for you. When God is for you, no man, nothing can stand against you. I want to give hope to you. I don't know what your situation is, but God is fighting for your life harder than you are fighting for your life. And he's fighting off those monsters. He's fighting off those demons. And you know what he's using? The rod and the staff to fight evil. Hello, somebody. He said, thy rod and staff comfort me. Last week, we talked about the staff. This week, I'm going to talk about the rod. You know what the rod is for? The rod is a weapon in God's hands. Hello, somebody. It's a weapon that's going to destroy the enemy. Yeah. David knew that weapon. He picked up stones and put it in his slingshot. And when he faced that giant Goliath that was terrorizing his nation, he said, in the name of Jesus, I'm going to destroy this uncircumcised Philistine. And boom, with one blow, that giant fell right on his ground. God has a weapon that when he strikes it, one blow, that giant in your life is going to fall right flat on the ground. Yeah. He has a weapon. Oh, glory. The scripture says our weapon are not carnal, but they are mighty in God, pulling down strongholds and any high thought that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. We don't wrestle against people. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but we wrestle against principalities. The scripture says we wrestle against demonic forces in high places. And the scripture says put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles and the strategies of the devil. You need to put on the breastplate of righteousness. You need to put on the belt of truth. You need to put on the shield of faith. You need to put on the helmet of salvation. You need to put on the shoes of peace. You need to put it on and then wear the sword of the spirit, the word of God, and pray it on every morning. And you walk out of that door and say, I am a child of God. No weapons formed against me shall prosper. I am more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. Oh, Jesus has a weapon. God has a weapon. You got to let God use that. We I feel like running in this house. God has a weapon. And when he releases that weapon, your enemy will fall. Your enemy is going to fall flat on the ground. Your Goliath is going to come out of your life because God is going to stand up. He's going to fight for you. He's the chief commander of your life. Hallelujah. Someone needed to hear that. Someone needed to hear that God is fighting for you. God is fighting for you when you're weak, when you're down and out, when you're ready to tap in and say, I'm out. God says, no, 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 I'm not done yet. I can go another eight rounds with this giant. Don't, don't, don't give up yet. I'm almost done. I almost got this giant in your life crucified. You keep going, Jesus. You keep going to that cross. And when Jesus couldn't carry that cross, it was too heavy for him to carry it. He had, God sent someone like Simon to help him carry it. Don't worry. You just got to keep in the game. Keep walking because Jesus is getting ready to win it for you. Somebody, he's going to bring someone in your life to keep you going, to keep your hands up. Moses knew about this when he was praying, and he had his prayer depended, his prayer determined the victory of the, of the, of the warriors, of his warriors in the field that were fighting. And anytime he got tired, they were losing. 
and his hands came down. But anytime he got the strength to go up, they were winning. And so what did, what did God do? He said, put, put, put two men on the sides of Moses. Hold one hand up and hold the other hand up. And if you can just keep praying, Moses, I'm going to fight this battle. What is God saying? You got to keep praying. You got to keep praying. You got to get people around you praying. You got to get the church around you praying. One shall chase a thousand, two shall chase 10,000. And if we all pray, oh, glory to God, and we hold each other up in prayer, that's why you can't go through this life by yourself. You need to, you need to be a cord. You need to link yourself, knit yourself with somebody that can lift you up and give you the endurance because the race is not for the swift but those that endure to the end am i talking to anybody and if you can keep praying through it god is going to show you one day victory he's going to show you victory he's going to show you victory it's going to be better than the nike sign that means victory he's going to put victory on the inside of your soul oh hallelujah the rod is our weapon it's god's weapon that is fighting for you the rod is also god's scepter that he's going to use for your glory. The scepter is a, a, a symbol of kingship. It's a symbol of royalty. It's a symbol of prestige that you have arrived to a place that brings honor and praise. I want to tell you something, young man, young woman. I want to tell you something, brother and sister, friend. I want to tell you something that God has a scepter for you. That when the fight is all done, he's going to hand you your crown. Oh, glory to God. He's going to put on a royal crown of righteousness. And you're going to walk with that royalty and saying, my God did it for me. Oh, do you understand what I'm saying? The angels in heaven are going to be in awe when we go to heaven because we are going to be royalty. Oh, yeah. We are going to be joint ears with Jesus. They're going to look at us. They're going to fold their wings and we are going to be God's trophy case. He's going to say, look at what I did for these people. And the angels are going to be amazed and to, they're going to sit down and listen to our testimonies in heaven and say, well, how did you do it? And you know what we're going to say? I didn't do anything. Thing. It was Jesus in my life. It is Jesus that made it possible. Worthy is the lamb who was slain from before the foundations of the world, who was able to open the scroll and bring my victory. Amen. God is going to bring you royalty in heaven, but he's also going to bring you royalty on earth. He's going to allow your name to not be a byword and to be a forgotten word, but he's going to cause your name to be written in the book of life and that when people hear your name, they're going to see Jesus. When people hear your name, they're going to see God coming through you. When people hear your name, they're going to remember Jesus because God wants to put his authority and blessing on you. God is ready to glorify you. Oh, hallelujah. I was amazed. With my testimony, that every time I tell it, people are saying, wow, God must really love you. you. And all I can really tell them is if I had no plan in this, I, 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 I had no, I was trying to work against God, if anything, trying to get my job my way, trying to relocate here and get this job here and every door is was closing. I, I was like, Jesus, not my, no, Lord, I want my will right now. I want my will right now. But, but when God was resisting those efforts in me, I had to comply to what he wanted for yeah. my life. And when I complied, then doors started to open in my life. And I didn't know how they opened. Let me tell you, when a door opens in your life, nobody can shut it. Your boss can't shut it. Your school teacher can't shut it. The, 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 people, that, the people that are against you can't shut it. The devil himself can't shut it. When a door opens in your life that God opens for favor and for royalty and for prestige, nobody's going to stop what God is doing in your life. And this is what he did for me. What the devil means for evil, God has a way of turning it around for good. The cross is a valley that we need to go through. The cross valley but it's also the most important valley to go through. Jesus said, if any man come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. All of us have a cross that we must bear. All of us have a cross. And Jesus, when he took up his cross, he said this about his cross. He said it was the most important hour in his life. It was the most defining moment in your life. Why you need to go through your cross valley is because it is the most important moment yeah. in your life. In John 13, verses 1, 
It says here, it was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. You know, Jesus, in this term, the hour, it's a very interesting term. Jesus knew about this hour before the hour came. He knew about this hour well in the beginning of his ministry. He spoke about this hour when people were starting to arrest him or get him and tie him up and he, and he easily slipped away from their grasp and he said, my hour has not yet come. He knew that there was a cross waiting for him. He knew that there was something that the devil wanted to get him on. He knew, but his hour has not yet come. But now in this passage, in this chapter 13, he says, my hour has come. And he is excited. He's been anticipating this hour. Yeah. Jesus is not losing his mind. It's not that he's loving the enemy to, to, to take him out. But he, it's this, this, this opportunity is a chance for his glorification. Amen. Let me tell you something. You cannot truly live unless you go through your hour. Yeah. Let me tell you something, that this hour is the most important hour in your life. It is the hour that defines who you are and lets the world know who you are. If you don't go through this hour, you will not know who you are. Everything you, are, you live for and everything you're created for all depends on how you go through this hour. She said, you can't follow me unless you take up your cross, not his cross, it said, your cross. Everybody has a cross. Everybody has a great fear. Everybody has something that intimidates them in their life. Everybody has a kryptonite. Mine was failure. Mine was being a waste. The devil knew that. And he almost got me to quit my Jesus. He almost got me to quit hope. But God, when I went through that experience... Yeah. I seen something that I've never seen before. And it not only helped me to see God in a more powerful way, I'm now a living witness speaking before you today. I'm doing this today. I'm talking to you today. I'm blessing beautiful Jasmine today because God took me through my cross. Hello, somebody. What is the cross that God wants to take you through? And if you've already been through a cross, you need to encourage other people to get their cross. But Jesus said, if any man come after me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross and follow me. This is, this is the hour of your glorification where God wants to get you, where God is getting ready to shine Jesus all over you. He wants to show you off to the world so that when people see you, they see the good works of God and in your life and they glorify God in heaven. As I close, this reminds me of the story of Daniel who lived faithfully before the Lord. And I remember one time I was having a restless night and I just felt something breathing. You know, I mean, something's breathing. Hot. You probably don't know this, but I just felt like something was breathing down my neck one night. I couldn't sleep and it was very tight on the neck and I was tossing and turning. And I, went to, and I finally went to sleep and the Lord gave me this dream, reminded me of the story of Daniel. And all I could see was Daniel in the lion's den. Those of you that don't know the story of Daniel, he was one of the people in the Old Testament who faithfully served God. He faithfully walked with God, and he was a leader in the city, and he did amazing things for God in the city. He prayed every day. But there came a time when the colleagues that were around Daniel conspired an evil plan to trick Daniel and to trick the king so that Daniel could be thrown in the lion's den. And their plan worked. He was thrown in the lion's den. But you know what happened to the lions? Their mouths were closed. Their mouths were closed. Their mouths could not open to bite them and tear them up. You know what this told me? That when, even when God puts you, when, when the enemy takes you into, you into your valley and you can feel the pressure of that, that darkness around you, God is saying, they can't touch you. <laughs> they can't touch you because I got their mouths closed. I'm just going to let you see them and feel them, but they can't touch you. They can't destroy anything until I give them the permission to destroy anything in their life. And whatever they destroy, I'm going to raise it up. And it was God has a plan, had a plan for Daniel that was, greater than the, uh, that was greater than the plan that was against Daniel. And when Daniel came out of that lion's den the next day, the king looked at him and was so happy that he was alive that he tossed those fellows that backstabbed Daniel into the lion's den. They died, and the ones that were 
tri- the Daniel that came out today became the person that everybody looked to and say that his God is my God. Come on now, some, don't you want to be the person that people look at you because they see the hand of God in you, because they see the power of God in you, because they see God had his weapon and he was protecting you and giving you royalty? Don't you want people to say, you know what? Your God is my God. Tell your neighbor and say, your God is my God. We got to close this here. The enemy can lead us in the camp, but the enemy can't destroy us because God is there closing the lion's mouth. And the most defining moment in your life is when you go through the lion's den because it's in that den you will receive. And when you come out of that den, you will receive your glorification.